For those of you who are not practicing alchemists, there's still an awful lot of interesting material in this whole concept of alchemy. And I hope I'm going to be able to show you what it's really all about, which was a huge misunderstanding in the Middle Ages. But also that maybe we're getting to the point where it wasn't such a mistake after all. Anyway, so here you see a couple of alchemists, or maybe it's an alchemist with his patron, more like. Um, and they're busy doing some kind of um, separation of substances, distillation. Now notice that the apparatus that they're using, in some ways not so dissimilar from what you'll find in a chemistry lab today. And this is what's called an athanor. You have a furnace, and you have a means of uh, carrying on uh, your distillation or whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, and you have to constantly keep it alight. It's one of the major things. So it does involve fire. And you're heating up, in this instance, it's probably making some tincture or something out of plants. Now, not all alchemy was about trying to transform metals one to another. Right? That's how you sell it to the king or emperor. Yes, I want to be an alchemist, your majesty, and uh, hopefully I can make gold. And... Uh, then, you know, I'll be able to render unto you. <laughs> and of course, the king or emperor or bishop, whoever it was, he's having to get a share of this gold, yeah, if he looks after this guy. So it's a bit of a Ponzi scheme, actually. Is that the right term? Um, <laughs> you're, you're trying to get the guys to fund you while you're carrying out your experiments. <laughs> So you're, you're actually a, probably more of a chemist, really. And you're, you're de developing elixirs, elixir of life, give you eternal life. Well, if it can sort of ease your chesty cough, that's probably a good thing anyway, isn't it? So they were not only working on these minerals, they were also working on plant things, making all sorts of extracts and so on. But you didn't also want to be condemned as a wizard or witch and be burnt at the stake or drowned or whatever they were going to do. So you had to make sure that everyone understood that you were not like that at all, that you were a scientist, that you were doing God's work, you were following in the path, pathway of nature, that you were doing the right thing. And this is what you were, you know, you were helping people with their health or whatever and to make gold for the king. So, one of the things that alchemists had to do, because underneath all that, there was also a secret doctrine going on, which I'm not going to go into today, but there was a secret doctrine going on about transformation of energies inside the human body and how to uh, bring about immortality in yourself and developing your higher bodies, developing your astral body, this kind of thing, which we would now call occult. They were doing a lot of that, but they couldn't be open about that because if they did, you know, they'd have been the first ones to be burnt at the stake. So what they did is they wrapped everything up in very pretty pictures so that you look at these pictures and you think, what the heck? You know, the, the king comes along and he sort of says, well, you know, I thought you were going to make me some gold. Oh, uh, what's this all about? And they say, oh, well, your majesty, it's... Uh, it's a very deep science, as you can see, and it, it's illustrated. And actually what this one's all about is this is about alchemy, the, uh, the goddess of alchemy, the, the principle of alchemy as Athena. And you think, well, why, uh, how on earth is this Athena? Well, when you look at it carefully, you see this figure here. She's the goddess Athena. She's wearing armor. She's got a spear. She has a shield with the head of Medusa on it. Now, I don't know if you know your Greek myths, but uh, Athena used to wear an Aegis with the head of Medusa on it. And there's the owl, which is the bird of Athena. And there's a sun here. Well, she's not a goddess of the sun, but that obviously represents gold. And it, there's the king who's somehow connected with that, hiding behind her. 
Now, there's also a pun intended in this particular picture that the alchemist's uh, stove, what they were going to do with their process on, is called an athenor. And there's a pun there, it's Athene and Athenor. Athene presiding over the Athenor. So there's these kind of hidden meanings, and, and this is obviously her, her castle that she is standing in, is, is the Athenor. In other words, alchemy is lurking inside this machine, which is what they are working with. And here you see an, another common image that appears in alchemical texts over and over again, the concept of the alchemical wedding. And you think, oh, what on earth <laughs> is that all about? This chemical wedding uh, of uh, a, a king and a queen shown here. And again, here you, see, here, here you see an Athenor at work making something which is going into here and, and, and here something else that's being worked with. And the queen is symbolized by the feminine principle which is used with the moon. Um, and the king is symbolized with the solar principle. And those are also silver and gold. And they're being joined together. And what's important here is that the alchemists understood, and we actually still perpetuate this to some extent to this day, that there are actually three parties involved in a wedding. There's the male, the, the man, there's the woman, and there's God. And the, the bishop here is standing in for God. He's joining the two in matrimony. And we see this in other images here again of the chemical wedding. And here you see the female principle standing there on the moon, the male principle standing on the sun. They're crossing their lilies together. Lilies represent virtue. And coming down from heaven is the Holy Ghost, the Numa Hagion, the, the uh, Holy Spirit that comes down from heaven and blesses the two and brings them together. So. Within alchemy, there's this understanding that you need the three forces in order to make this thing work. You can't do it without God, is what this is saying. And it's, you, you find this over and over again. Here it is again. In this one, you've got the dove of the Holy Spirit coming down from a star. So there's the sun, the moon, and the star. The astral influence coming down. And... Finally, you've got them here, they're in the bath. Now the bath, obviously this represents, uh, you dissolve these things, the gold or the silver, the principles that you want to bring together to do your alchemy. But you do also need this third force coming down from the sky, represented this time by what's more like a descending eagle. Now notice something else on this particular slide. You've got the apples here of the moon. And then you've got fruits of the sun in this tree, but I think the moon ones are more prominent here. And this is something else that you see in these al alchemical texts, are these trees bearing fruit. Because one of the principles of alchemy was the concept of multiplication. That just as you take a seed and you plant it and you grow it and you get a crop, you multiply Using nature, you multiply the seed. So the apple tree, someone's planted a seed there many years ago, growing up to be the tree, and it's growing, it's giving you the apples, the silver apples, and the same with the gold tree. In order to get gold, you have to have gold to start with. It's one of the, the dictates of, of alchemy. And in order to do that, one of the concepts that they had um, was the idea that if I had some matter, let's say I had this cup, right? Now, this cup is made of material, materia. In this case, it's glass. And they would understand that this material has weight, mass to it, and it has form. And they distinguish between the form and the mass. 
And what they would try to do in medieval times, I don't think the ancient Egyptians would be coming to them thought quite this way, but the medieval times, they had the idea that they want to transubstantiate this. What they would want to do is to remove the form, in this case glass and cup form from it, to, to find the actual matter, and they would project upon it the form of gold or silver, whatever it is they were going to do, so that the matter would then be transformed, transubstantiated into gold. And of course, this comes into religion. And I don't know if any of you are Roman Catholics. I was brought up as a Roman Catholic. We have the idea at the Mass that the priest takes the host and he holds it up and he says certain words. And although it still has the form of a piece of unleavened bread, the, the actual matter of it has become the body of Christ. Now, if you're a scientist, that's complete nonsense. But you can see where these ideas are coming from. It's this idea that there is a separation can be made between form and matter, actuality. So the form might appear to still be bread, but that's at, in actuality it is now transformed into the body of Christ. They've got that idea from this kind of concept of ancient alchemy as it developed in the Middle Ages. So you can see that in reverse with alchemy, that they want to transform the material and project the new form upon it to make the new gold that they want. Now, to do that, you had to go through certain steps. And there were, there were textbooks on alchemy. Just as you today go out and buy a textbook on chemistry, uh, you could go out and you could buy a textbook on alchemy written by one of the great masters that were highly respected. Someone like Basil Valentine, for example. And you go and buy his book and you're puzzled over it, <laughs> to be honest. You start reading it and you're, what the bloody heck is this all about? But what you would learn is that there are certain steps. Now here, I, and I love this picture, which is why I've, I've produced it. I used this one last year. I'm sure some of you recognize it, who were in Bath last year. You've got here uh, this gentleman, and he's, he's wearing a blindfold. And he's not seeing what's going on. He's blind to the reality of what's really going on in this world. And over here, you see a second gentleman. It's either the same guy or it's someone else. And he's noticed a rabbit going into this hole. Right? And the question then is, we all know it. We've all seen the Matrix. Yeah, how deep does the rabbit hole go? How deep are you willing to go to find out the truth? And he's preparing to go in with the rabbit. Either that or he's put, putting, I think it is a rabbit that's going there rather than a ferret. But if you go in through the hole, you would find underneath this mountain a staircase leading up to a, a secret chamber, a sort of marriage chamber. And you can see, uh, it's not too clear on this wall here. Can you see it? The symbols of the sun and moon. And there's a phoenix there. And it's kind of like a step pyramid. And these figures on the pyramid represent the planets with Mercury on the top. And you've got signs of the zodiac around it. You've got fire, ignis, Aries, air, terra, earth, aqua, waters. So you've got this whole thing. And these steps are marked things like calcination and uh, putrefaction and solution. There's... there's there should be 12 in all. I think there's only nine here, but normally there are 12 of these steps, which are processes, and most of them we still know from chemistry today. Things like distillation and cal calcination means heating it hard in a, in a crucible till you're left with a calx, which is ash, basically. So these are the processes that if you were a student alchemist, you're going to have to learn 
how to do all these things. Just like when you did chemistry, as I'm sure most of you did, you had to learn about titration yeah, and heating things up with a Bunsen burner and weighing things. You know, we, we all did all this, didn't we? Practical. And the thing about alchemy is it was essentially a practical science of what you were wanting to do. And remember, what you were wanting to do was to take away the form of whatever the prime matter. This is the problem. I'll come back to this problem later, but you needed your prima materia, your first matter, which you were going to perform these things on to get your gold. The only problem was you didn't know what the first matter was because <laughs> they don't tell you in the book. It's the big secret. What do you start with? And they tried all sorts of things, you know, they tried out coal, they tried out urine, they tried out feces, they tried out plants matter, they tried all sorts of different things as their first matter. But of course, if you don't know what you're meant to be working with, it's not going to work. So anyway, this is kind of what this is all about. Now, there are various stages in the process where you know you're, you're, you're doing the right stuff, you're doing the right thing. And one of the first stages was what's called the nigredo. So you've got to take your first matter and you bake it hard in a crucible or in a test tube or whatever you're using until it breaks down to form this kind of black powder, the nigredo, the black stuff. And this is kind of the taking away of the form part, right? So you've, you end up with this formless black first, you know, matter, the, 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 the early universal matter has, hasn't yet got a nice form to it. You've taken that away and that's your first stage. And you can see the black crow baking down these, these twins uh, interestingly holding a rabbit, so it must have gone down that hole anyway, um, to get down to that. Then the second stage, you can carry on doing your processes in the right order, and you can get to what's called the peacock's tail, the Corda pavonis. And here you can see this, this lady here, all these peacocks with their tail, she's, she's wearing ermine, She's got a rainbow round her head, the, the uh, dew of heaven is pouring down on her. Um, and she represents that apparently your material, when you've worked on it a bit further and you've gone a bit further down the line, develops all these lovely colours. And this is what you're told to look out for. You've, you've had it baking on your athenor, perhaps for months. <laughs> You have to keep feeding this ethanol. You've got to keep, like having a wood burning stove, you know, you've got to keep, keep looking after it and stocking it up. You mustn't let it ever go out. You've got to keep constant temperature. More like organic chemistry, actually, in that sense. And if you keep doing that, eventually you're going to see, ah, I've reached, I've got the second day, I've got, you know, I've got the peacock's tail, which must be some kind of fluorescent blue with goldy colors in it, just like a peacock. Have you ever seen a peacock with its tail open? So that's your second stage, and you're you're now you're, you've, you've you've still got a long way to go, but you know you're getting you're getting there. You're 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 progressing. And then your third stage. Now again, you look at this and you think, what the heck? <laughs> I mean, if you were doing your A-level chemistry, and I said, right, um, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, we turn to page 30 and you'll find the diagram for how we're going to make the white stone. And you turned over and there's this. <laughs> You'd say, well, you know, where are you coming from? But it's actually quite simple when you get down to it. What you have here is a figure, and I'll be coming back to the twin-headed business a bit later. Uh, you've got fruits of the moon tree here, the silvery fruits of the moon tree. And standing on a hill, it's got this lion. Now why a lion? Well, within alchemy, the lion, very often a green lion actually, represents aqua regia, which is 
uh, a mixture of nitric and hydrochloric acid, which is so strong it will dissolve gold. So it's royal, you know, the royal, royal water, aqua regia. And got that under control on a chain, <laughs> and uh, with a wand is commanding a serpent. Now, it's actually a three-headed serpent. If you are someone who's dealing in snakes, I if you've ever seen a person who controls snakes, but they use a stick to hold down the head and to control the thing so that they can put it in a basket in Egypt. So I've not seen it personally. I've, I've seen a rattlesnake a bit too close for comfort, but I've not seen this actually being done. But I've seen it on film with a guy with a stick and he holds, holds the head down of the, the serpent and he's able to grab it and put it in a sack or basket. So you've got con some kind of control over the aqua regia and over the serpent, the three-headed serpent. Now why three heads? Well, it comes back, and I'll be talking again about this shortly, but the idea of Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest Hermes, thrice great, three, a triple serpent. Hermes is connected with the serpent. And then you come to the final stage, which is the red stone. Now, I should say that the white stone here, if you, you can use that to project. Now, the, the idea is that you have uh, your stuff that you're going to transform, and you need this stuff to project upon it, mix with it, and it will turn it into silver. Wonderful. <laughs> Great stuff, just what you want. Or this one which is the last stage, which can make gold. So you, you've got this stuff, and it's, a, it's um, a calculus. Now, a calculus doesn't mean um, logarithms or uh, dx by dy or whatever. It um, means a stone or a rough stone, not like a crystal. Not, not lapis means, is a stone like a crystal, but a, a calculus is like a hard stone lump. And that's what you're making, which you can grind up to make a powder. In this case, a red powder that you can project onto the other stuff and turns it into gold. So if you can do this, you're worth your weight in precious jewels. <laughs> Every king would want you in his court if you could do this. Not easy. And in order to do this, you needed the assistance of Mercury or Hermes as your teacher. And here you can see, there's the, oops, there's the alchemist, busy, you know, in this case, he's got this fire going here. And, and there's Mercury coming along, and he's sitting down here. Um, what does that mean? Well, I think what that really means is some kind of intuition some kind of guidance from the spirit world, actually. Uh, I've not investigated that, but that's what I think that, that particular picture is talking about. But it also refers to the teachings of Hermes or Mercury, um, as understood in, in, by these, these uh, medieval people. Now, you must understand that the Egyptian god Thoth, or Tahuti, of Egypt was uh, when the Greeks conquered Egypt they came across the Egyptian gods and they looked at what Thoth was supposed to be able to do and what he had taught he, he's the one who's taught the Egyptians how to read and write he invented the hieroglyphs given them science taught them about mummification about building pyramids you know he's he's that kind of guy so they say well this sounds to us like the sort of role of of are Hermes. So they called him Hermes, but to distinguish him as being different, they called him Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes. And here you see a typical representation of him with an armillary sphere, because he understands astronomy. He understands which in those days was synonymous with astrology. And there are all these weapons here. This is Caduceus. Uh, his uh, suit of armor, I don't know why he's got that there. 
and some kind of guy here lying drunk. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. But anyway, there's, this is a typical way you'll see Hermes represented, dressed in his Arab, Arabic garb of the day. And you'll see that. And there's actually a wonderful representation of him looking just like this on the floor of Siena Cathedral in Italy. Uh, so if you ever go there, it's worth looking out for that. Because th the reason why this guy was so important to them was that uh, a, a collection of writings called the Hermetica came into Europe in 1453 after the fall of Constantinople to the Turks. And the Greeks who were there, who could, escaped. Some of them, you know, they could give money or perhaps they got out a little bit earlier before the final siege. However, and they took with them whatever they could. And at least one guy took a, a copy of this book from the library, which had been, this book had been lost to the West for centuries, a thousand years and brought it to the court of Cosimo de' Medici. And he immediately had it translated. He got Marsilio Ficino, who'd been working on the works of Plato, said, look, put that Plato stuff aside. <laughs> Translate this for me, because it's all written in Greek. And they believed it was written in Greek. And of course, Enoch, they believed that Hermes was the same person as Enoch. Right? Thoth, Enoch, Hermes, uh, in the Arabic world, they th call him Idris, companion of the prophet. All these guys, they're, they're antediluvian. Enoch's the great-grandfather of Noah. So what he knows is antediluvian. And they believe these books are written by him. So th the older, the better. This trumps the works of Moses. So you've got to have this, you know, this is the great, this is the real stuff. It's like us finding a cache of Atlant uh, records of Atlantis, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't we like to know? So anyway, so that had a huge effect. And of course, in, in Roman times, uh, Egyptian doctors were the best. And they were known to have a lot of knowledge about alchemy and about transforming metals into gold and uh, these kind of uh, techniques. So Hermes must be the guy as far as they're concerned. So another writing that came into, uh, into the West from Arabic was something called the Emerald Table of Hermes. And this was uh, regarded as the sacred writing, the most sacred writing of Hermes, which tells us all about alchemy and the, the operation of it. And I'll just change this slide. None other than our favorite Sir Isaac Newton, the father of modern science, who you would have thought, you know, the only calculus he was interested in would be um, differentiation and integration. He actually translated the Emerald Table of Hermes. So I'm going to read it out to you, if I can find it. What's the slide number? 16. Yes. Right, now this is, this is actually Newton's translation of the Emerald Table. True without lying, certain and most true, that which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below, to do the miracles of one only thing. And as all things have been and arose from one by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing, by adaptation. The sun is its father, the moon its mother, the wind hath carried it in its belly, the earth is its nurse. The father of all perfection is in the whole world, is here. Its force or power is entire, if it be converted into earth. Separate 
Thou, the earth from the fire, the subtle from the gross, sweetly and with great industry. It ascends from the earth to the heaven, and again it descends to the earth, and receives the force of things superior and inferior. By this means you shall have the glory of the whole world, and thereby all obscurity shall fly from you. Its force is above all force, for it vanquishes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. So was the world created. From this are and do come admirable adaptations, whereof the means is, is here in this. Hence I am called Hermes Trismegistus, having the three parts of the philosophy of the whole world. That which I have said of the operation of the sun is accomplished and ended. So what is this one thing that does, that does everything by adaptation? Well, I'll come back to that, but to me, this sounds very much like what in Christian terms we would call the new Mahagion, the Holy Ghost, or we could call it the breath of God. Yeah, because if you read the Old Testament, God creates and he breathes life into things. And what is that in reality? It's what we would now call energy. And it's the energy works everything, does everything. And its primal manifestation, of course, is electricity. But we'll come back to that as we go on. Right. So Thoth, the scribe of the gods, was a teacher of science and language and recorder of souls. So he's the, he's the instigator of alchemy in all its forms and all the wisdom of ancient Egypt. So what was this wisdom that they were teaching? Well, as I said, he, he wrote, he's, he's alleged to have written many books. The Book of the Dead, as we call it now, or the Going Out by Day, is just one of them. In fact, it's, that is more like an epitome of what must have been much larger collections of writings. That's more like, if you went into a, a great cathedral or somewhere, and you picked up a hymn book, and you read through the hymn book, it would tell you quite a lot about the Christian religion, because you could read that in the words of the hymns. They're telling you about this and that and different feast days and so on. It's not actually a textbook of the religion. It's a practical application of it. And you can see that the Book of the Dead, which is read over the dead body of the, or the mummy at the time of the funeral in Egypt, is an epitome of what they believed. And what they believed was supposedly written down by Thoth. And he's supposed to have written, I think, 32 books or more, which have been lost. We don't know where they are. And people, I know people who've actually been digging around in Giza, looking under the Sphinx. Where's the Hall of Records under the Sphinx? And doing ground penetrating radar and digging little holes and, and other people scanning inside the Great Pyramid. Um, I knew Rudolf Gantenbrink, who sent the little robot up the shaft and found the little doorway at the top. And, you know, we, in the Orion mystery, which I wrote with Beauval, we've posited that there's probably a room up there. And I've met clairvoyants who say, yes, there's a room up there, you know. This is what's inside it. I've seen it with my mind's eye. Um, okay, love it if there is, but we haven't found it yet. What we have found is masses and masses of inscriptions all over the place. You go to Thebes. Have you, have you been to Luxor? And you walk around there and you, you go in Karnak Temple and every column's got all these hieroglyphs all over it. Masses of stuff written there. <laughs> Only a small amount of it we've, is actually in books that you can go out and buy. I imagine they, if you go into the subject in depth and, and you work in the British Museum, they might show you more. You might be able to find out more. But for the average Joe in the street, we're only seeing a tiny amount of what's actually out there. Well, you know, there's huge amounts of this stuff. 
And one of the things that has been found is the laden papyrus. Now, I'll come back to this. That the, um, I think it was 1784, something like that, that it was discovered. What had happened, the, there was a Roman emperor called Diocletian, and I think it was 305 AD, he issued an edict that all alchemical texts were to be destroyed. And the reason he did this was that there was a mass debasement of the currency <laughs> going on, that people were mixing other metals with, with the currency, and he wanted this stopped in his empire. So they went through, and they were very thorough about this, they went through Egypt, destroying all these texts and stopping people who got their little laboratories going or whatever. And that was it. And, and as far as we know, nothing was known about this for a thousand, over a thousand years. And then it, just by chance, I think, as I say, it was 1784, um, a jar with some of these texts came to light inside a coffin that had been dug up. And it seems like the guy who was buried in the coffin was an alchemist. <laughs> And he'd had these, these texts buried with him. And nobody really understood what they were at the time they were found. And the, they came into the hands, I think he was a Protestant pastor, and he donated half of these texts to Leiden University in Holland and the other half um, to Stockholm University. So there's the Leiden papyri and there's the Stockholm papyri, and nobody really looked at them at the time. Because, of course, nobody could read hieroglyphs in those days. And in fact, I don't think it was in hieroglyphs, it was actually in Greek, but even so, they, they couldn't read it. Well, eventually someone did, and they discovered that at least some of these texts were alchemical texts. And they read more like um, cooking recipes that just as you would have Mrs. Beaton's cookbook and it's got all these recipes of how to make this and that and the other. So, so these recipes are how to make your gold <laughs> or actually to multiply your gold. And I, I've got a, some of it here. I'm going to see if I can find what I've got. And I'll read it out to you because it's, it's actually fascinating. And I, I, if you're interested in this subject, I do, do think you should try to get a hold of this. You might find it on the internet if you look, look around at the laden papyrus. All right, I'll read you this one first. Careful analysis of the alchemical recipes indicated that they fell into three separate categories. The first was recipes for manufacturing gold-like alloys, for testing for the purity of gold, and for plating base metals with gold. And the second was recipes for staining or colouring the surfaces of alloys and crystals. The third were recipes for writing in letters of gold or silver. Right, so here's a recipe taken directly from the Leyden papyrus. It is practical technique for making brass. Right. An exact preparation of asem, preferable to that of asem properly so called. I'll explain some of these terminologies as we go through. Take orichalcum, one drachma, for example. I, I'm guessing that a drachma means a, what we would call a dram. Throw upon it four drachmas of salt of Ammon or Cappadocian salt. Remelt. Add to it one the lamello, add to it lamellose alum in an equal amount equal to the weight of an Egyptian bean. Remelt. And to it add to it one drachma of decomposed sandarach. Not the golden sandarach, but that which whitens. Then transfer to another crucible previously coated with earth of Chios. After fusion, add a fourth part of Assem and put into use. <laughs> Does that seem clear? <laughs> 
Now, this needs some explanation. Orichalcum, or or I spelled it O R or A U R, as as it was sometimes spelled, was an alloy consisting mainly of copper and zinc. In other words, what we today call brass. Salt of Ammon, or as we would say, salammoniac, is a crystalline form of ammonium chloride. Cappadocian salt is a salt derived from the Cappadocian lakes. I'm not sure what this is, uh, what this contained, but probably more than just sodium chloride. Okay, actually, I don't know exactly what that is, but... Lamellose alum would be flaky alum, which is aluminium silicate with one or another metal such as potassium or perhaps ammonium as the positive ion. Adding this is a good way of including aluminium into the mix without having to separate it into its metallic form. Obviously, to separate aluminium, you need tremendously high temperatures, or if you're going to use electricity, you need a very high current. It's not something they had available, but this is one of the interesting things I've discovered in looking into ancient alchemy, is that they did use other metals besides the, the normal ones that we think of, like lead and tin and, and so on. They, they were able to use things like zinc and magnesium, uh, but they used them in compound forms as salts, and mix those in, and then get rid of the salty part, the ions, in some other way. That's what a lot of these processes were about. Um, there are two kinds of sandarac. The first, the golden sandarac, was a resin obtained from North African gum trees. Now, that's not what they wanted. Uh, it was, and sometimes still is, used as a varnish. The sandarac, which whitens, was another kind of, of arsenic, uh, arsenic sulfide. So, in other words, they're using arsenic sulfide as a sandarac. The term decomposed sandarac in the above would seem to indicate that native arsenic sulfides were somehow roasted and the resulting product, which would be essentially arsenious oxide, was then used in making alloys. Good God, it's a wonder these guys survived, you know, more than one, one attempt at this. <laughs> Breathing in all these arsenic fumes. That's probably why so alchemists are, are regarded as being a bit crazy. You know, they probably were exposing themselves to all sorts of noxious things. Um, Chios is the name of a particular Greek island. Earth of Chios would seem to be a particular clay found there. Now, I don't know why that particular clay, but perhaps it had some metal in it, like magnesium or something. Um, the use of metallic salts and compounds rather than pure elements is quite common in alchemy. The old alchemists may not have known of elemental zinc, arsenic, antimony, or even sodium, potassium, or magnesium. However, in compound forms, these metals were known to be very important often being incorporated in their so-called assem. Assem was usually a crystalline substance that was scraped off from the upper part of a furnace. It seems to be the origin of the concept of a philosopher's stone. A white powder you scrape off, or a red powder you scrape off. The manufacture of a good quality assem was essential for the success of the whole process. It could be added to copper to make brass, a cheap substitute for gold. Alternatively, with a slightly different recipe, it could be projected onto copper and turned into a silvery amalgam. Now, this is the head of Tutankhamun, as you know. Some of it's made from 24 karat gold, some of it from only 18 karat, and I think even less. You know, it's, they, they knew how to make gold in different ways and multiply it. Now, as I'm sure you all know, 24 karat is pure gold. 18 karat, in other words, only three quarters, it's common in jewelry. Nine karat gold, uh, is often used in gold rings. Uh, and the reason for that is you want something that's going to be tough, because if it's 24 karat, it's too soft. 
and white gold, when it's amalgamated with things such as zinc, palladium, silver and nickel to make the gold look white. Now, of course, all this was going on in Egypt before the days of Archimedes. And I'm sure you all know this. Archimedes is famous for saying Eureka when he got in his bath. Remember that? Well, what was he saying Eureka about? Well, he'd found a way to assay gold when it's not easy to measure. If you've got a nice big ingot of gold, you can measure it. Yeah, so you know the volume you know, from measurements. By doing it this way, you put your gold object, a crown or whatever it is, into your bath or big trough of water, and you see how much water comes out, collect it, measure it, you know then the volume of your gold, and you can get its specific gravity. So you can see if it's pure or not, or how pure, or how impure. But of course, Archimedes wasn't around in those days. It was by the time um, uh, the Romans were closing down the, the alchemical labs in, in uh, Egypt, but this wasn't known at the time of, of Tutankhamun. I think I've got my dating right. Is that correct? Tutankhamun was long before this. Long before. So, those are actually brass cufflinks, not gold. They have the appearance of gold, but they ain't. As far as I can tell, the prime, primum materium that you really wanted was copper, or was actually um, something that contained copper. And you've got three main mineral ores to choose from. Cuprite, well I presume that comes from Cyprus, Cuprus. Uh, that's Cu2O. Or you could have malachite, it's more common. Uh, that's a sort of copper carbonate mixed with a copper hydroxide. Or chalcopyrite, which is copper iron sulphide. I think that's more common than those. I think this is pretty much all used up these days. But in those, in those days, you could roast this to give you, you know, CuO, your copper oxide. That would be your black stuff. So you can see where you, the, the black stuff that you want to work with is your rendered down um, malachite or cuprite that you can then use in your further processing. And your peacock's tail was probably some kind of copper salt. You know, copper has this blue color and copper sulfate. We've all played around with that as kids. Um, I think it's probably something to do with that. So there's your black stuff, your negredo. Now, of course, these days we all know about the periodic table of the elements, but these guys hadn't a clue about any of this. They would have loved it if they had known. They would have loved the idea that it's all in octaves and that there's this, this recurrent processing of, uh, in periods where the, um, the metals in different groups have the same kind of chemistry one to another and the non-metals too. Um, but they only knew uh, really about these ones. Um, they knew iron, they knew copper, silver and gold. There. They knew of mercury, carbon they knew, sulfur and chlorine, tin, lead. They also knew about um, arsenic and antimony. Uh, I'm not sure if they knew them in the uh, elemental form or if they just used them in compounds, but they certainly did know about them. And I think they probably knew bismuth too. They, they're all group five, I believe. And you see pictures like this one, the green lion eating the sun. Well, that's, what's, that? what, what's the reason for that? Well, I think what they were doing, this is a way of purifying gold. That if you've got gold that's been adulterated with copper, you dissolve it in your aqua regia, and then you can use chemical processes to remove and, and precipitate out um, 
the copper or the gold. You can separate them that way. Uh, so then you can get back to a much purer form of gold. I think that's what that's all about. And the triumphal chariot of antimony, that so they seem to be using antimony for something or other. I'm not quite sure what. I think it's something that you added to metals to make them tougher. But I'm not quite sure about that. But this is a book that was written by Basil Valentine, who I said was one of the uh, authorities. Abbot Creamer was another one that they like to, cr to uh, quote from. So what does that have to do with, with us today? Well, it seems to me, uh, this is a guy that I'm sure you've all seen, this Christian Birkeland, who at the turn of the 20th century was carrying out very interesting experiments where he was projecting um, cathode rays at what he called a torella, which was a magnetized ball representing the Earth that was charged. And he got the effect of northern lights. So he proved that um, the northern lights were actually caused by particles coming in at the North Pole and the South Pole and illuminating. That it was actually an electric current that was coming from the sun to the Earth that was causing the northern lights. Of course, nobody believed him at the time. He was crucified by his fellow peers, uh, scientists, who were clinging on to the idea that, that there's nothing, it's empty, it's empty space. How could there be any electric current in an empty space? Well, of course, it's not empty. Though it's, it's not a vacuum. There's actually a thin plasma throughout space, and it is quite conductive of electricity because it's composed of charged particles. And the electricity can flow in two ways. It can either flow positive or negative. So he was onto something. Um, and I want to come back to this figure of Mercury. Uh, this is another diagram from a book by Michael Mayer. And here you sh see how Mercury, or Hermes, you can see the symbol for Mercury there, and he's holding the two caduceus of Mercury. And this guy is having to back away. That's too strong. And this one, although he's coming forward, he, he's also in, in awe of, of the power of Mercury. And this one is also very curious because you see how this figure here is androgynous. He's got two heads and he's actually got two sets of genitals. And down the bottom here, you see Hermes, Caduceus of Hermes, winged hat, embracing Aphrodite, the Greek name for God, Herm Aphrodite. And that sort of saying that Mercury is bipolar. That, yeah, the Mercurius energy or power is bipolar. And I think that's talking about electricity. Again, positive and negative. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I think the whole hermetic secret of alchemy is all about, really. And they, they were reaching out towards it. They didn't have at their, their fingertips the, the machinery that we have today to be able to fully embrace this whole concept of, of what the energy that drives the universe really is and how it works. But they knew that somehow it's bipolar and they knew that it goes through everything and it run, runs everything. And they were trying to work with the best way they could with transforming matter from one form to another by removing the form and projecting a fresh form upon the, 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 the crude first principle, as they would understand it, and turning it, changing it from being uh, base lead into precious gold. So that's really what alchemy is all about. And the curious thing is 
that if you went to the lecture last year at Bath, um, you would have seen the Sapphire guys, and they were being a bit cagey about what they were going to say because they've got various patents and things they're working out. But it does seem that in their, their experiments that they're doing there in Sapphire, they are finding that they are producing elements that weren't in there when they started. In other words, using relatively low amounts of energy. You know, it's not nuclear bombs in there. It's not um, anything like that. That they are able to turn matter from one form to another. And they're, they're also saying that they believe that the transformation of, of, of atoms in stars doesn't happen in the middle of them. This whole idea that there's this big atomic bomb going off in the middle of the sun for billions of years, and then one day it's going to blow up, and all this stuff will go out into the universe, and eventually, give it eons, it will condense in clouds and form another star with some planets, yeah, and in those planets will be a bit of gold, a bit of silver, um, no, 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 it's going on all the time. And there is also a suggestion, and I've discussed this with actually Wall, that maybe such processes are actually going on on the Earth. Do we know everything about this Earth? Do we know what goes on inside it? No. It's very interesting, the place you find gold is, is where you've had volcanoes, where you've had lava flows. Now, if those volcanoes are not just uh, you know, plates crashing together and some bit of magma coming up and spewing out, but there's an electrical charge going in at the planet at those points. Could be some transformation going on there. Certainly the ancients believed that, that the precious metals were being made by Vulcan, the god of volcanoes. And they knew very well that that's where you go and look for it, where the either an extinct volcano, a mountain now with streams, and the gold is collected in the streams, or maybe even an alive, active one. So I'll leave that with you, but it, it looks as though the, uh, within the next century, perhaps a lot less, people are going to, you know, they're going to think, well, why was it such a big deal? You know, you can manufacture gold, you know, you just all you need is a plasma, and you know, what would you like? Oh, I'd like a, you know, a couple of drachmas of gold, please. Okay, uh, <laughs> put your money in there, switch it on, out comes a gold ring. You know, it, it, it's going to be like that. It's just that we're ignorant. And we, the problem that we have with everything about our science is we always assume that we're clever, that we now know it. Yes, those people 100 years ago, ah, they didn't know anything. We know it now. We've got our, our, you know, we know about black holes and we know about dark matter and we know about this, that and the other. No, we're profoundly ignorant. And once we recognize that we're profoundly ignorant, then we can start having a real science where we start really looking with open eyes and looking to see what else we don't know instead of focusing, you know, I'm clever, I know, you know, I'm a, I've got my PhD, you know, in this, that and the other. No, okay, you maybe know something, but it's probably that much compared with this much. So we need a little humility. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And you'll probably want to go out and buy an Athenor now. Okay. <laughs>
bought them and they kept them hidden because they didn't want to disgrace the father of science by revealing to the public that he was dabbling in these crazy, stupid, occult nonsense, you know, like alchemy, that, you know, he was pristine, you know, he's a saint of science, and his sainthood must be preserved at all costs, and not darkened by this uh, stupidity. But of course now these things are coming out and being published, um, and you can get some of his papers. One yes. of the speakers at Bath suggested the Egyptians used electricity. Is there anything in the yeah. alchemy text? Yeah, well, I know that there is this theory and, um, that the Egyptians were using electricity, and I've actually been in that vault underneath um, the Temple of Dendera, and you get in under there, and there's this thing that looks like it might be an electric light bulb. And everyone says, see? You know, they knew all about electricity. Well... I don't know. They, they, maybe they did. I don't know. But we haven't found their generating plants yet, and we haven't found their solar panels, um, and we haven't found their wind turbines. We found the Tesla so, coils. Hmm? I, I took yes. little three pound ones from B and Q. You hang them up in trees, and they're solar powered. What's um, that? Light bulbs. Light bulbs, yeah. Well, you haven't you found it. Don't need, you don't need an, electric, an, an external mix. You just need the sun. Yeah, well, you need something that's going to turn that sunlight into electricity. And as far as I know, nobody's found that in Egypt yet. Well, having said that, I accept that the technology of ancient Egypt is not Stone Age. It might be, they might be made of stone blocks, but the way they've been perfectly carved and the hieroglyphs carved in so carefully thousands of them, not just a few, thousands. And the Great Pyramid perfectly aligned, you know, north, south, east and west, and, and the, the proportions exactly right. This is advanced technology. Where, where that technology came from was it people who came from the stars, landed their flying saucers, did all this stuff, and then flew away. And what, what was left behind were the equivalents of Polynesian guys in grass skirts, you know saying, well, yeah, we, yeah, we must have made this. I don't know, but it's clear that somewhere down the line, someone had advanced technology. I remember in my chemistry at school, if you heat mercuric oxide, I think it's black or red, yeah. it turns into mercury. Would yeah. you feel it made mercury from... Something? They certainly use mercury a lot, yes. Um, yeah, I think they use red mercury as, as, as the red stone, you know, that you were, what they were doing was they were taking gold, they were mixing it with mercury, and they were adding in other metals, which are particularly copper, to keep the red colour. So you wanted to get the balance just right. You needed the mercury to give it weight, or lead. Um, but you needed, uh, mercury's good for making amalgams, as you know, but you also needed to be adding in copper to give it the red colour, and you needed to blend all these things together and perhaps add something else, like some zinc, or, you know, what they, th these various things that they talked about in that papyrus, to give it the right consistency. So you end up with something that looks like gold. And remember what I was saying, that they have this idea that what makes something gold is the appearance of gold. So you need the substance and you need the appearance. And they, they don't call it necessarily just gold. They call it gold of the philosophers. Aurum philosophorum. So I think they did distinguish between this kind of artificial gold that they were making and natural gold, which, you know, they got out of the ground. That's what I think, anyway. Question down the back, though. I'll make some sort of basic comment about just alchemy and chemistry. Um, okay, I've got a place in Larnaca in Cyprus, and the beach is still actually green from these oxides. From, from, the, from the copper? Yeah, from copper. Yeah. And probably the original discoverers were just if light a fire in the sand. Yeah. Just like you know, carbon ash, it will take the oxygen out of that green, and you get copper. You get metal. Well, one, one very interesting thing is that in the ancient world, Cyprus, Cuprus, is where our word copper comes from, was where they got most of their copper from. Yeah. 
they got their tin from, from Britain. And, you know, and you needed the two to make bronze. But so, discovery, it's not mining, it's just there. It's well, but what I wanted to get to here was that this is a totally different subject, and I'm, I'm going to close in a sec. Yeah. But it's interesting that people, when they refer to the ancient Britons, they assume they're all naked savages before the Romans came here. Oh, you know, yeah. they paint their faces in blue, and you know, you know. well, they can't have been. They, they were totally in touch with the Middle East for thousands of years because they were the ones who were giving, you know, selling them the tin that they needed for making bronze. They knew all about that and they had, they had chariots and they had very good iron. If you go to, um, we were talking about this in the break earlier, if you go to South Wales and go to Cardiff Museum, you look at the pre-Roman iron work, these guys were, you know, using masses of stuff made out of iron, which is hardly surprising since in South Wales you had iron ore and you had coal, and you're not going to tell me, just as you were saying about in Cyprus, the, the green stuff, that fire one, you're not going to tell me these guys hadn't found these black rocks lying around and discovered that it, they burn and give a really good heat. I'm sure that they were smelting um, iron using coal long before we think. I mean, in Kent, where I live, the Romans had a lot of iron plants and they'd have to use charcoal and they cut down trees and make pits and they get a little bit of iron. In Wales they wouldn't have needed to do that which is perhaps one reason why they were so resistant to the Romans. They're bloody good weapons. You know? Anyway, that's a, that's a by the by. I think we should close there because I think we've got to clear up, haven't we? And yeah. You in charge? Well, thank you very much. All go? Yes. Yeah, thank you.